we're going to do, we have a lot to do today, actually. I'm going to talk about Soren Kierkegaard. I've been asked, uh, if all the people I've been asked to cover um, from the contemporary age anyway, it's Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Um, and of course, they're not entirely unrelated. And Soren Kierkegaard, he only died at, at 42. He lived and worked the first half of the 19th century. And he created what we can loosely call a, a Christian existentialism. Existentialism is an extremely important movement that Kierkegaard more than likely founded, at least intellectually speaking. He was a Protestant. He was a, a uh, Lutheran um, faced with the rise of the industrial state, mass armies, mass bureaucracy, and church membership that may have been large, but the size of the membership really has nothing to do with the quality of its members. A key element in all existentialism is what we've covered before, the mass man, or Heidegger would call Das Mann, um, Michael Oakeshott, there are so many others who dealt with this phenomenon of what becomes of the average normie individual in the age of the centralized state and centralized capital, where the so-called free market, whether it be in political candidates or commodities, has to reach the lowest common denominator to maximize their return. The consumer society is a mass society. Some of you have heard the some of the campaign ads, especially the shorter ones on the video channels, and I've never seen them this bad before. They're really at a second grade level. And that's because they want a maximum turnout and they can't alienate anybody because numbers matter. In fact, numbers are the only thing that matter. Mass society um, is not just central to Kierkegaard, but to, to everyone else. Ortega made the argument that the immense complexity of modern life is such that people are content with believing they know something because all their neighbors pretty much at the same level think you do. Um, power matters, not, not authority. Um, the core concept of existentialism, no matter who you're talking about, no matter what political position they hold, you have existentialists of every background, but it's a particularly postmodern phenomenon. And that's the idea that as a person, you're expected to make important choices about your life. And in front of you, at any given time, there is a huge number of options. Uh, in, in important issues and unimportant issues. But you have highly limited knowledge. Not only that, you are fully responsible for the choices you make with um, your highly limited knowledge. And even if you had a lot of knowledge, you don't know how this is going to work out over time. And yet, regardless, it's still your fault. A mass society comes into existence to avoid this problem. They throw themselves, they project themselves uh, onto whatever is fashionable at the time. Anxiety is one of the key elements. Existentialism was the first movement to deal directly with these moods, moods of anxiety, despair, depression. Remember, psychology was a part of philosophy up until the 20th century, maybe a little bit before. Um, psychology is a secondary field in the sense that it derives from fields more uh, more universal. History, philosophy, of course theology at the top, and then everything else derives from them because every other field has to situate itself historically and um, have a philosophical backing. That's what makes you know, the primary fields and the secondary fields and the tertiary Stupid things like, you know, marketing and, and, and accounting, which are not academic topics. Anxiety is one of the key elements that Kierkegaard deals with. This is what he calls the dizziness of freedom. The greatest danger that a human being has in this era, 
is the loss of the soul. And what he means is the loss of yourself, not some collection of things that you've done, but the reason why you're here. Um, and losing yourself to the mass or to some other you know, ideological or philosophical category happens slowly, and it happens without your realization. Um, being true to a mission is extremely difficult. Um, and of course, the ultimate mission is to bear yourself entirely uh, before God. The great sin, the sin of inauthenticity, which you, you know, Sartre and Heidegger and everywhere else, is to avoid all these choices by throwing yourself into the, into the mass. And there are two, there's two traps, the, the infinite and the finite uh, uh, error. The infinite, of course, is overthinking. The fact that you know too much, and because you're faced with so many options, you end up thinking yourself out of everything. An action then ceases. The finite one is to conform yourself to the mass. Um, so this kind of choice, or any choice you make, has to be based on why you're here. Dizziness here is what results from this massive, this, this sheer magnitude of choices and possibilities that are available, plus the fact that you have to choose. You can't not choose. Uh, and it creates a certain kind of uh, paralysis. Anxiety derives directly from this. Anxiety is this, this fear of a future outcome that may come from a choice you make. This is the problem with, with freedom. People want the benefits of it without any of the consequences. Of course, only the most sensitive have this, this particular anxiety. If you're legitimately ignorant rather than just trying to be ignorant, you don't have much anxiety, and you certainly have a lot of self-confidence because you don't have any standard in front of you. The bar is not low, that the masked man doesn't see a bar at all. The highest that they go is rule-following, the civic mentality. But this sheer number of possibilities, the fact that you can't just not choose, and what may happen into the future is the source of this anxiety. One of the most bizarre things of the postmodern world are people without an education, without any knowledge at all of the, the, the deep truths of theology, deciding for themselves, quote-unquote, uh, their religious future. This is now not, not, not betting at your personality or a business or a bet at a horse track. You're betting the future of your soul on almost nothing. The masses don't understand this phenomenon. They think they know enough. They can't explain it to you, but they know enough. And yet you're betting your soul on all of this. Even denying the existence of the soul is a kind of massification. This, all told, leads to dread. Dread is a big term in existentialism. Dread is something that's repulsive. We want to run from it. Dread comes from the fact that we realize that the soul is being bet. Our eternity is, is being bet on what we know and the choices that we make. And what the heck, if it's the wrong choice, what's going to happen to me? It's so easy to avoid the difficult road of, of building this, this selfhood with all of its flaws. And the lowest rung after that is despair. This is when the anxiety reaches a, a, an extreme point where you're, you're resigned to it. And you want to, as Kierkegaard would say, rid yourself of, of yourself. This is a sickness of the spirit. It's a disease that affects the entire person and their life. Of course, it has no clear symptoms, though. Again, the masked man doesn't understand this stuff. Choices are easy. They don't think too deeply about anything. They don't know how. They're suspicious of people who do. Their confidence comes from their ignorance. This is why you can't pretend to be ignorant. Ignorance is truly bliss. But despair, 
doesn't necessarily mean that they're miserable. And this is where the trap is located. They can seem happy. They can be convinced or convince themselves that they're happy. Success in the world is one of the deadliest traps because you may think, well, this is these are the constituents of happiness, therefore I must be happy. And yet you are drowning in a despair that you could hardly recognize. This happens with anxiety all the time. People don't realize how stressful, how, how anxious they are because it just becomes a part of their background feeling. It becomes a norm or the norm without realizing how unhealthy it is. And despair is just an extreme version of that. The masked man, as Kierkegaard would say, is, is subjective towards himself, but objective for others. In other words, they'll put a yardstick to measure others, but that doesn't exist when they're talking about themselves. In our case, it should be the opposite. Objective with ourselves, subjective with everybody else. And the first step out is to be aware of all of this. And this is particularly important to the 19th and 20th century, since the modern world was already decaying into the postmodern, uh, the postmodern mentality where even the self comes under attack. One of the things that may be a, a, a function of despair is this constant projection onto, well, first of all, it's purely an earthly matter. Um, it, with anxiety is an earthly matter. Despair is both. But um, the to be aware of it actually is to make it worse. Uh, so what, what happens is those suffering this level of anxiety conflate their identity with a situation or, or, or an identity, um, and this identity, you have no control. You have no control over this. People who have money and who believe that this is the route to happiness are deep down very anxious and miserable. They just, there's, no, there's no subjective awareness of it because this is all they know. That's their, that's their new normal. Projecting yourself onto an identity, whether it be a businessman, any of the archetypes that society offers, you have money, all it takes is one downturn in the economy, one bad lawsuit, banks calling their loans back in, and that's it. What happens to you then? What happens when you, running from this despair, project your identity onto something else? It could be athletic, it could be anything. You know, athlete can be injured at any day, at any moment. These are highly tentative identities. But in mass society, most people don't really know that there are any other options. The self then becomes identified with what amounts to a, um, a distraction. And when this conventional identity, conventional role is destroyed in a million different ways, your selfhood is destroyed. And the truth of the matter is, is that humans have very little control over their external environments and what happens over time, the choices that they that they make. Now, Kierkegaard says something else of great psychological value. Let's say you have thrown all of your eggs into the basket of being an athlete and you do very well and you think you're sort of happy. Deep down, you know it can go at any moment, but the day comes where it does. You're injured. You lose your motivation. Um, you know, they, you're caught doping or something like that. Something that destroys this, where you can't do it anymore. The level of despair that they feel isn't anything new. It was always there. Except they had this conventional identity to paper it over. But even in the beginning of the 19th century, everything from sex and drugs and money, reputation, athletics... These are limited identities, tentative identities, to the point where they're actually um, distraction. Only when you fail, you put all your eggs in this basket and it doesn't go anywhere, or you do very well and then fail. The intensity of the feeling 
is a gift because finally you know that this has always been there. There is no rational reason to put your identity into something like this. You realize how bad off you've always been. This intense anxiety, dejection, despair, even dread is um, it's not a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition of self-discovery. Your position in the universe is shown to you in plain terms. And you really can't lie about it. People lie all the time, mostly to themselves. Things aren't your fault. This is how I was raised. Whatever, you know, nonsensical excuse. Um, the existentialist creed is that there are no excuses. Sartre made fun of Freud because he would say that you know, Freud posits actually three different people living inside your psyche. And if something goes wrong, the one that's dominant at the moment can blame the others. Your selfhood is hiding behind. You no, know, there's only one self. But even in psychology, they're building structures to avoid responsibility. No excuses is the slogan of the existentialist movement. You're at fault for the choices that you make, and it's righteous that that be the case. If you pretend that you didn't know what you were talking about, or I was young, or all the excuses that you hear, that's a lie, and you know that's a lie. There isn't an orthodox teacher out there, and we'll see here in a minute just how close to orthodoxy Kierkegaard gets, entirely on his own intellect. As far as I know, he had no contact in the Netherlands. Um... Um, Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, any other place where he, he didn't really have any connection with, with orthodoxy, but you'll see how close he, he becomes. Overcoming this failure, overcoming this period of utter crushing despair is a necessary, but of course not a sufficient condition for coming to God. There's not an orthodox teacher that doesn't say it's crisis and misery and depression, and disillusionment, and dislocation that creates a Christian. Because really, everything else that you've been distracting yourself with is gone. You're all by yourself, and really either you either kill yourself, just live in, in, in this horrible depression, or you um, approach God for the, for the very first time. And yet this is the first step to being with God. And he doesn't get into great detail what that might mean. He has the handicap of being a Protestant. But in his writings, he, he lays bare the problems with, with Protestantism and how it really doesn't have much life in it. And some of the things he concludes are not to be found in uh, Protestant teaching, not even in the Lutheran teaching of, of Northern Europe at the time. Another source of anxiety is this idea that we live either in the past, where we beat ourselves up for all our mistakes, which are always more vivid than successes, or in the possible future. These are abstract. They're abstractions in the Hegelian sense. I mean, Kierkegaard, like pretty much everything in the 19th century, was a reaction to, to Hegel. And someone like Schopenhauer, you know, talks about the, the you know, bizarreness of, of fleeting pleasures, that you work and work and work and work and work to be something. But even when you get to it, which is a big if by itself, the novelty wears off pretty fast, and it becomes normal to you. That's why money and success really don't make anyone happy. It may make you happy for a brief moment. I finally arrived. But the way our minds are wired, we get used to it. It becomes the new normal. And we even start taking it for granted until we lose it. But reducing the human person to a set of goals and projects is an error. Are all the goals and projects that we have at any given moment, is that 100% of who we are? 
well, what's left? What's this fundamental thing that's left? And this has something to do with coming to realize who you are as a, as a person. The present is such a rare, fleeting idea. As far as God is concerned, there's a big difference between eternity and infinity. Infinity is just a never-ending line of discrete things. Um, the concept of, of eternity doesn't, doesn't deal with time at all. There is no time in eternity. Everything is the eternal now, as St. Augustine would say, the eternal present. Imitating that is yet another step that you can't do anything about the past and you have no control over the future except for the choices that you make now. And even then, there is no guarantee that things are going to work out the way you think they will. This is why it is so important not to, uh, in a secular realm anyway, not to identify yourself too closely with your goals on a on a day to day um, on a day to day basis. Life is not past, present, and future. Due, just due to our own limitations, it is the eternal present as much as humanly possible. Man is a part of nature which in the Enlightenment was such an odd concept. I think in alchemy, in the Renaissance, it was it was understood, just not preached very loudly. And he talks about walking into, uh, away from civilization, and into the natural order, just in its pristine state. That this is important for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, the natural objects we see around us, so long as we're away from anything conventional, you know, buildings and roads and other people, we see that we're quickly removed from any goal we happen to have because natural objects don't seem to have them. Falling into uh, some version of Aristotelianism, whether he realized it or not, um, animals and plants simply, they're not aware of anything. They don't have goals. They simply exist. They don't compare to each other. They're not anxious. They don't have a conception of the past or the future unless it's um, genetically built into them, like saving for the winter and hibernation and things like that. But a walk in the natural world removes us from civilization and hence convention, things that men have created rather than uh, things that are natural. And I mention this because he has a work called The Lily of the Field and the Bird of the Air which come from, of course, the, the New Testament. And he interprets it in the same way. Lilies and birds, among many other things like that, don't have the anxiety that we do. They can't live in abstract times. They only live in concrete. And the only concrete time that we have is the present. They don't compare um, their ability to build a nest with others. They simply are. A lily blossoms because that's what it's supposed to do, and there's nothing else. They're never striving to be anything. They simply are. They do what they do because that's how they're, they're made. And then he comes to the idea of silence, which is nowhere to be found in Protestantism. And as all of you know, this is essential to Orthodoxy, the Hezekiah, um, Hezekiah which essentially is, is, uh, is the silent life. Little did Kierkegaard know that he stumbled on orthodoxy simply by his criticism of the postmodern world. Men are, it seems, almost naturally drawn to noise. Noise is yet another technical term in, in Kierkegaard's world. Um, that the anxious man is constantly ruminating. Um, using words and using cliches and using conventions to judge themselves in one fashion or another. Silence is a different story. It's not to say that strategy and, and you know planning your life is not a good thing, but it certainly isn't the only thing, and it certainly doesn't exhaust who you are as a human being. The only way to get to that is through silence. This kind of anxious rumination can destroy 
the good that you've done, the good that you might do. It does paralyze action. Words are distracting. To a great extent, words are conventional, especially in this era. Uh, even things like poetry and even liturgical poetry can serve as a distraction from um, the problems that you face if you, if you interpret it in the wrong way. The flowery poetry that, that we may come across or the fantasy um, uh, storylines in TV, movies, um, all of that is a distraction because it's almost impossible for us to relate to any of this. Words are as conventional, especially now, as, uh, as anything else. Clichés is ultimately what happened. Clichés are the language of the mass man. And all of this, taken together, is noise. Sometimes it could even lead to a false connection with God if we're moved by something. Being moved by poetry or whatever is, is temporary. And it may be, in fact, a form of delusion. Delusion is yet again another term that's used uh, often. But silence, to remove yourself from the conventional, including language itself, is about uh, listening. It's, it requires a great degree of humility. We can talk ourselves out of things all the time. And worse, we can rationalize. We can rationalize our errors, which is just another response to anxiety. And then, of course, he says silence is the best form of prayer, which is a strictly orthodox idea, which had no foundation in Protestantism at all, even in the Lutheran mind. He got to this simply on his own, not realizing that this is central to theology elsewhere. He, you know, without realizing it, was on this slope to, to orthodoxy, especially uh, uh, monasticism. And in Kierkegaard, his famous uh, breaking of his engagement, which he never quite got over, he was a single man. He, he lived a monastic life, more or less. And even that is not part of um, Protestantism. Anglicanism is not Protestantism. It's almost like an old Catholic movement. This is how to, at least for a while, escape from the world. Um, the way that rational discourse goes, it's dependent on what we think is logical. It's dependent on what words mean at the time. It's a way to avoid serious questions. Man always seems to be in this process of becoming, but never arriving. And as civilization decays, it becomes more and more difficult to stick to anything. It's easy to develop this ADD because there's so much around you and so many choices. In this search for the right one, you see that nothing is, is static. Commitment is really something that's foreign to the mass. And I mean a commitment to a serious um, ethical or, or, or intellectual end. Because that requires a tremendous amount of self-discipline. It requires the ascetic life that Protestantism threw out. And Kierkegaard starting to realize was a mistake. He doesn't say this explicitly. But this is what silence comes down to. If you're drowning in conventional trappings of success, you're still going to be miserable. You just won't know it. Because you'll, be, you'll have these things dancing in front of you at all times. Temptation, though, is when you are on the right track. And you realize just how difficult it is. This is somebody who is living a very rational, even the ascetic life. And he's looking around and seeing everyone else having a great time. Apparently happier than he is. And this is really the, the origin of temptation. And certainly, if you yourself are creating this lifestyle, then there's no reason, since you created it, there's no reason why you can't deviate from it. But that goes even more so for the Christian life. The bar could never be lowered. Saint Seraphim, uh, Father Seraphim Rose said, or Blessed Seraphim Rose said, um, we are we maintain the apostolic standard no matter how far we deviate from it maintaining that standard in and of itself 
is a source of, of salvation. We realize that we're miserable. We realize that we make tremendous uh, mistakes. But that's why we are objective with ourselves, or should be, and subjective with everybody else. If you, let's say you're, you're an athlete and you're working out every single day and you realize how much time is, is for something that may not even work out and so you take one day off, which is something you haven't done in a long time, the next time you take a day off, it's going to be much easier. If you lower your bar just a little bit, the next time you do it, it's going to be much easier to the point where you're doing it all the time. This is why these things occur very slowly. This is a part of obedience, and it's something else that Kierkegaard puts out as a virtue, something that postmoderns could never comprehend. Obedience by itself almost seems to be a, a, a bad thing. Obedience also has to do, and in my book I talk about uh, the first person to ever talk about the metaphysics of Benedict and Romuald, the Western um, Western ascetics. Um, these these um, obedience is to a place, it's to a regimen. It's accepting that this is who you are. So it all comes down to a single choice that everyone has. And for the most part, we know we're talking about probably a minority of the population. The alternative to mass man is some variation of, of aristocracy. It's a difference between a, a country being governed by aristocratic families uh, versus a country governed by bureaucracy. They're not only very different things, but they're opposites to one another. A, bureau, a bureaucratic operation is a is is where the mass man derives. But because the only two options are God is is God and Mammon. Mammon being a demon connected with with money. But really, it's connected with any passionate desire, and I choose my words carefully. Passion doesn't mean enthusiasm. That's kind of what it means today. It's usually a bad thing. Passion. We get the word patient from it. To be passive, it's all the same word. It's something happening to us rather than us doing something. How easy it is to, to allow this, uh, this passion to, to overwhelm you because then you claim that you're not responsible for the results. So those are the only two options that you have. There's no serving two masters. It doesn't even make sense. That's like saying you know, the Christian could take a day off and do whatever he wants. Because, you know, I, I work hard towards this, or a monastic that, you know, just could take a day and go into the city and, and not be a monk. It, it doesn't work that way. You do that once, it's going to become the norm from there on in. This is why obedience to this mission, your obedience to an abbot, your obedience to a bishop, whatever, um, your, your natural hierarchical superior is essential. This is why um, the spiritual advisor is so important. Because it is very easy for us to lower the bar even a little bit. And over time, the bar will cease to exist. And this comes to probably what Kierkegaard is most famous for. The idea of the leap of faith, which derives from him. That phrase is used all the time, first to be found in, in Kierkegaard's work. It's meant to be a form of action. The leap of faith um, and really, the concept of, of faith itself, we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, is when we throw ourselves onto the mercy of God despite all of our doubts, our doubts as to what God is, our doubts as to you know his existence, our doubts as to whether we're good enough, whether we're doing the right thing, regardless of that, we throw ourselves into the abyss. The gospel is something to be lived. If you don't have any doubt, you're not thinking. And this could, doesn't just go for God. It goes for everything we do has faith as a foundation. We get married believing that we have done the right thing and that this love is going to be eternal. We don't know that for a fact, but you enter into these agreements 
um, through faith, at least to some extent. Any contract we sign, there's an element of faith there that is going to be followed, that you're going to have the ability to follow. Gospel is something that is only partially something that's read and understood. Yes, it's written down, but words are notoriously difficult to maintain. Now think of it like this. There's two ways to understand any object. Think of something like the ocean. I think Kierkegaard uses a lake as his example, but there's two ways to understand this, this body of water. The first way is to analyze it in depth, you know, whether it be its salt content or its buoyancy, the amount of it, um, what's floating around, it's to understand water from a purely scientific point of view. But is that actually understanding it? Because the other way you get to understanding it is jumping into it. Those are two very different things. The jumping into it, of course, is also, to some extent, a leap of, of faith. Now, even if, and this is, this is where things get cloudy, even if you do all of this, there's plenty of people who, you know, by all appearances, are doing the right thing, and yet still are anxious. Now, where is this joy that we're talking about? You can do all of the above, and this has a lot to do with this concept of rule following, and you're still living with discontent. Um, and this is what happens when you allow the past and the possible future to rule everything. He uses the phrase to be present to yourself today, now. It's not something you could put off for the right time. This lays entirely in the present. In the present, which of course is very is very difficult. I mean, um, he talks about the lily of the, uh, of the field, and he says, once it reaches its end, meaning its purpose, and it flowers, and it does everything else it's supposed to do, well, is this the, the end of its growth, or is this the beginning of its decay? And he says there isn't an answer to that. It could be both, it could be neither. Importantly, though, he notes that the lily itself doesn't care. Future and past are traps. But they're very common traps because we're talking about very sensitive people here. Discontent, which can lead to anxiety, derives from, from viewing yourself from the point of view of either one of those, especially the past. Our memories are very to say the least, they're problematic, depending on how distant, uh, the, how distant the memory is. It's, a lot of it is our own creation. We fill in the gaps of our knowledge and over time really believe that these things happen. So even if you are viewing yourself from the past, sometimes it's not the actual past. What Kierkegaard is talking about in all of this is that moderns live in project mode. We just have one um, task after another without asking what's underneath all of this. We are not just the task that we set out for ourselves. But this is where discontent uh, comes from. Getting away from that is living in the present. Why does the lily bloom at all? And the reason is, is because it does. Silence, obedience, joy. These are the three steps, again, with, with a certain orthodox flavor to it that I don't think he's, he's truly aware of. Uh, one of his most famous works is Either Or. And uh, there was a point in college where I was really into him, especially the philosophical fragments and uh, sickness and to death. And uh, it was such a long time ago. Uh, it, it's good to get back into this because Kierkegaard, despite the problems with him, is worth reading. The existentialists are always appealing because they seem to deal with, with things that we feel right now. Ancients didn't have the alienation that moderns do because there was no such thing as a mass. When citizens of a society live according to their estate, the different functions that every society needs to work, there is no alienation. Mass man comes into existence when those estates or functions or classes fall apart. <clears throat> 
You're born into an estate. You're trained from a very young age to be a part of it uh, at, at a much earlier age. You know, it could be military, it could be academic, it could be religious. It could be business-oriented. And that was never any question about it. You don't really need formal schooling when you're born and raised there. There's no question uh, as far as alienation is concerned. This is your identity that has many duties as well as many rights and many privileges. And there's usually an association that protected you. Well, even when Kierkegaard's writing, by the, you know, the, the later half of the first half of the 19th century, that was gone. Capitalism, in fact, went out of its way to destroy all of these institutions, from the peasant commune to the urban guild, um, to having feast days and, and, and fast days off work, to be protected by an association that not only takes care of its sick and injured members, but also maintains a high standard of production. And you can't work in a skilled craft unless you're a member of a guild. This had not just economic uh, consequences, but also psychological consequences. Capitalism destroyed all of that, creating this abstract individual with which only capitalism created, only this capitalistic destruction of human nature that rendered the individual alone, completely without protection. That's where the mass man comes from, and this only existed in the end of the modern, the beginning of the postmodern era, which is exactly when we're uh, when we're talking about. Kierkegaard and Marx wrote more or less at the same time. Um, and this isolated individual is um, is very unnatural. It's deformed, and is loaded and saturated with anxiety. So the alienation of, of, of this age didn't exist a millennium ago. Now, and of course this is why he's writing. This, this, is, this is a completely different uh, sort of theology than something that St. Basil, St. Benedict was going to write about a uh, millennium and a half ago. The circumstances um, are not the same. Existentialism could only have risen in an era where all the protections for the individual, not even the family, certainly now, um, all the protections for the individual in terms of his development um, are gone. And one of those is the Christian life, which in mass society is just one option among others. In the postmodern world, you hear idiots talking about their, their own truth, personal truth, which doesn't make any sense. Truth is objective for everybody. Now, some truths are more relevant than others, but it doesn't mean that they're anything other but that, that, but objective. Truth does have a subjective element, though. Existentialism deals with the subjective far more than the objective. But the objective truth, the truth as such, um, is a, an empirical or deductive set of facts, a uh, logical design that's beyond debate, things that um, you don't, you know, especially in logic, you don't invent logic, you uncover it. Logic is the foundation for a truth claim or a claim of falsehood, not a claim in and of itself. But there's no personality there. This is a problem with the modern scientific idea. They hide their own personal agenda because they're not supposed to have one. But why would you do it if you don't have a personal agenda? Subjective truth is a different story. This is something that you experience. It's not separated from objectivity. Um, these are facts and, and logical circumstances that you, in fact, have lived or have been forced to live. There is no such thing as a personal truth. But some truths are more important than others, and usually the more important ones are the ones that you know uh, from experience. It's one thing to analytically talk about how awful divorce is in a society. We know the destruction uh, that kids never recover. Single mothers are, are often extremely poor. Child abuse, criminality, everything derives from divorce because the family is the core of everything. But until you actually go through one, until you witness it in your own life, you don't see the personal element here. You know, 
it's difficult to prove something like love. You know, we've all come across atheists before. Um, Paul Witz's book, that atheism comes from a lack of a father figure, has a lot of uh, data behind it. And they ask for some kind of proof. And you know damn well, if you gave it, they still wouldn't accept it. That's why it's a stupid thing. It's just a rhetorical device. It's almost a, a, a distraction. But something like matter certainly can't be proven either. But something like love or justice, its existence, it proving its existence seems to be an odd request. But we all know it's there. No one questions it, despite it being too ethereal. Um, and without that, anxiety really can't be can't be understood. How do you describe empathy to a, a psychopath? or love for someone who's never been in, in love before. This is why the subjective truth, which is of course objective, but objective, uh, some, something objective, objective that you've experienced. That's why this is so important. Yes, a psychopath could understand empathy from reading a dictionary or reading a paper on it, but it's just words on a page. And it's like a constitution. A constitution is a meaningless document unless it actually manifests the best parts of a society. Otherwise, it's just words on a page. People will be able to read into it whatever they want. This was uh, something that Luther himself realized, that the people without the theological education, part of an order or whatever, when they read the New Testament, they just see whatever they feel like. Only the most sensitive people see themselves as, um, as imperfect. Christianity, he wants to stress, given this age, though, is, of course, objectively true, but that doesn't matter. It can be objectively true, and you could know this, but it doesn't mean you have any devotion. It's a subjective truth for this reason. It's beyond the finite. Um, it's, it's understood this way. He's not saying that it's not an objective truth. Remember the publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee did everything right. The Pharisee was a believer. He tithed. He gave to the poor. He attended all, did everything that, that the law mandated. And yet he was still condemned. That's the problem with rule following. Simply following rules leads to arrogance, if you can do it very well. Not to mention that when you do it, you look to God and you say, okay, now you owe me salvation. Rules are abbreviations and are not, um, not radically uh, objective. This distinction is extremely complicated. Um, but anything beyond the finite, objectivity becomes tenuous. And that's why faith is important. Faith is a word that has to always be defined in context. Because faith also means to be faithful or to be loyal to something. But Kierkegaard, given the age which he's writing, faith is something that's, as I mentioned, that it exists in all choices. It's a balancing act between doubt and truth. There are very few things that we know with absolute certainty. There are reasons to believe X, but there's also reasons to doubt it. That goes for anything that we happen to do, including our own, our own personhood. But faith exists when you have both. I can make a case for and against a lot of things and make them very... Um, believable and yet we still have to function we still have to accept certain things there is an element of faith in everything and we have no choice but to do that and in fact everything has an element of of, uh, of faith to it you can't not have doubts not just about the church but but anything we may do our family life and everything else but the existence of a rational doubt is proof that you are being faithful See, the person who knows that God exists can't have faith. There is no, it's not a virtue to simply accept something as being obviously true. This is why God always seems to be hidden. He, he doesn't make himself obvious, especially in our era. But if he did, then there would be no virtue. There would be no struggle. There would be no asceticism. People make the stupid argument that, that why does God allow these terrible things to happen? 
which is also another way of avoiding um, taking responsibility for anything. But the answer to that is, well, what are you, what are you saying? Why doesn't God just create utopia for us? Even the Garden of Eden didn't last. Now, they weren't perfect. They were just innocent. Dostoevsky and Nietzsche both say that, that, of course, God could do that tomorrow, and we would destroy it. We would destroy it because it's boring. This is why God behaves the way he does. This is why he manifests the way he does. All of this is a struggle, but that's part of uh, being a human being. But the book Either Or is is worthwhile. I read it ages ago, and I just had to refurbish it. It's a, it's a debate between two people. Uh, the first is a hedonist, the, the ascete, as he calls it, the aesthetic life, the seeking of, of pleasure, chasing one thing after another, never content. There's no real reflection, but constantly chasing this kind of self-aggrandizement. But he is discontented. We know what pleasures do. Pleasures don't last for very long. And even if they do, we get tired of them. But the other person, in Kierkegaard's mind, is no better. And that's the, called the sometimes you call it the, the, the ethical life. I think more, uh, more accurately, it's called the civic life. This is a rule follower. This is the Pharisee. Even without the, the arrogance. This is a man who lives by ethical rules. He's the idiot that goes 55 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone like a, like a, like a lunatic. Um, he follows everything. Of course, there's got to be a little bit of self-righteousness in all of this. He tends to be a bit of an idealist. Talk about putting faith in something. Um, and the book is letters. Um, these guys write letters to one another and they tear each other apart. The point of it is to see that both approaches are deeply flawed. Um, the the ethical man makes fun of the, the aesthete and simply talks about the pursuit of pleasure as ultimately, even if you find it, it doesn't last. Um, and he breaks down the whole hedonistic argument. It is shallow. It's not human. But then, of course, he responds saying that you are boring. This is an unfulfilling life. And both are completely hopeless. Both are loaded with anxiety, dread, and despair. But there is a third mode, and that's the religious life. This isn't just, you know, following something as sort of modern you know, philosophers today do. There's an idiot on, on YouTube who lectures on this stuff, and all he does is he takes these ideas and reinterprets it for a postmodern audience, which is just another way of saying he, he destroys it. He's talking about God as such, God is the only thing that is eternal. It's a it's a it's an object that doesn't go away. And it really is. It it it's it's amenable to reason, but not entirely reasonable. In his work Fear and Trembling, it's really about uh, Abraham in the Old Testament. It's a way to explain the religious life when he's supposed to execute and sacrifice his son, because God says so. That's his leap of faith. The abyss, I mean, there, there isn't, you know, the abyss could be good, it can be bad. But if Abraham had thought about it rationally and overthought it and overthought it and overthought it, he probably wouldn't do it. Um, because that's what this overthinking does. The man who this leap of faith is non-logical. There's not a whole lot of tests, there's not a whole lot of direct evidence that we can easily digest. And Kierkegaard says to have faith is to lose your mind in order to win God. Our mind are, it, it, it's even thinking of the Old Testament, the Ecclesiastes, um, that begins by saying that everything is meaningless apart from God and that there is no meaning without God. And that's why the, the modern world, um, accepting this, said that it's man that has to create meaning, which is another way of saying the most powerful property holders um, decide what meaning is. 
and they use the word man as kind of this dishonest uh, uh, cover story. Both of these men <clears throat> that Kierkegaard is explaining, um, both of these men are, are, are living in anxiety. It's meaningless and transitory. God is the only option from a purely rational point of view because he doesn't go away. Our minds are so limited. Our language is, our la language is created in practical life. This is why we use um, much older, you know, liturgical Greek or old Slavonic because those definitions were built at a time where this was taken for granted. These terms that, that you know, uh, words have changed so much using old Latin makes a lot of sense because those meanings will never change. But even there, even there, we tend to read whatever we want to. But both of these men live the, this very anxious, um, pretty much meaningless life. Think of, um, think of a relationship, a marriage, for example. They, by their very structure, creates anxiety because you are swearing to God and to one another that you're going to love each other until the day you die. Well, it's hard to know that. In fact, you don't know that. That doesn't mean you don't do it. But that's yet another leap of faith. But let's say your wife wrongs you somehow. Now, here is someone who you have dedicated your life to. You're supposed to become one person, and yet you realize that she has wronged you in a very serious way. How far are you willing to go to rationalize it? It's better that you're in the wrong, because at least then there's some justice to it. It would be rational to hurt you. And so, in some cases, uh, men do this, women do this. You invent the story that you've done something wrong. So at least it makes sense, because if she's hurting you for no reason, then the trust is gone, love doesn't exist. Now, why do I say this? In the relationship with God, we are always in the wrong. And that's what removes anxiety. We realize that our sin we realize that our sins are um, are always going to be there in the phenomenal world. There's no avoiding it. Now on the noumenal, the mental uh, that space, you can be perfect. You can have the proper beliefs. That doesn't mean uh, in the choices that we make it's going to work out that way. But we maintain it through obedience. But there's no doubt in our relationship with God that we're always in the wrong. Therefore, there's no question of trust or anxiety. We are, God, you know, does something we don't like, a situation comes up. We are at fault. It's our arrogance, our limited minds that have allowed this uh, to happen. Despair, as I said in the beginning, is separation from God the source of joy. It's a taste of hell. It's sin, not just in the actions we get. Sin isn't really an action. Sin is the foundation for action. The self is important. It's the soul that makes you you, not just in the projects that you have, but more uh, fundamental than that. Everything you are, that which produces the projects that you take on yourself. Despair is not becoming yourself. For him to say be yourself isn't some nonsensical dating advice, which is meaningless. No, it's what you were meant to be, which is, you know, scholastic. It's Aristotelian. He doesn't define it necessarily as reason and freedom, as Aristotle and Thomas and so many others would say. But there is, like Skovoroda in Ukraine uh, a century earlier said, there is a deep sense of uh, vocation in you. What you are meant to be, running from yourself, is as much misery as um, uh, wanting to approach God and still not being good enough. That's what sickness unto death is in his mind. But to not be yourself in this sense is another uh, taste of hell. Not following this deep vocation. What were you born on this earth to do? And even then, of course, there's a certain amount of faith to it. To be yourself to be what you were meant to be. Which is, by the way, extremely difficult. It requires obedience and discipline. And God, of course, is at the, the core of it. 
the sickness of the death, the fear, the ultimate dread, is even if you accept this vocation, following the gospel, in a sense, and living it, you still don't see yourself as without sin. One of the worst forms of anxiety. And modes where despair shows itself is to accept all this, do everything right, do precisely as Kierkegaard in the gospel lays out, and you still, the problems never end, saying that, no, I'm not good enough. I haven't been faithful enough. If I believe in the gospel, what happens if I'm simply not good enough? The judgment, the way that the concept of the judgment has, has been developed, the final judgment, or the, the temporary and the final judgment, it's your own condemnation. God's light lights all our lines up, all our rationalization, everything the existentialists talk about. All the hiding that we do, trying to avoid responsibility, all of that is laid bare. We know what we are under that circumstance, which is very hard to do while we're, um, while we're alive. The sickness unto death, this idea that, that even if we kill ourselves, our soul doesn't die. So we can't even have that. I mean, the atheist is better off in that sense because they only have to worry about the finite. Although I'm not sure what uh, soul death, um, how that's better. The real sickness, the real pain, the ultimate lowest agony is to believe all this and still say, I'm not going to be saved. But as I said in the beginning, this is exactly where salvation derives. Everything is laid bare. This is the, the maximum despair because we know what that might mean. The existential despair is to lose this self. Even living for God may not be sufficient. This is why faith in mercy, why this saves. It goes beyond justice because if, it were ju if God were simply just, none of us would be saved. That's why Christ preaches this, this idea of going beyond simple what people deserve. Because if you get what you deserve, you're in trouble. Now, love and mercy are unjust in the sense that we're getting much less than we deserve. Christ showed us what man should be. Christ alone can do the impossible. We're too rotten to be saved, but so long as we maintain this mentality, God will take care of the rest. His use of the word absurdity is very similar to his use of the word impossibility. Humility saves. Not pride, not the, the, the masses, not, not success. It's where truth reigns without deceit, without arrogance. All is light. And of course, hell is the precise opposite. Thank you everyone for listening, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.